Good morning. Stand. I would like to open the service with prayer this morning. Let's pray. Father God, your word says that this is the day that you have made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. So this morning, we come into your house, and we gather together to be glad, to worship you, and to be thankful for all of your generous gifts and love that you've put on us. Father, we pray that your spirit would inhabit our praises this morning, and that today we would leave this place with a fresh feeling in our hearts and in our minds. And for those that are watching on live stream and will watch later, Lord, I pray that you would use this time to bless their hearts. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's children said together, amen. The Bible says in Revelation 4.11, you are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things and by your will they were created and have their being. Let's sing. Mighty. 
Amen, amen. Good morning and welcome to Green Ridge Baptist Church. It's good to see all of you here with us this morning. Welcome to everyone who's watching at home. Can we just take a quick moment to let out a collective sigh, because I know it's on our minds. These masks are back. Let's just all, ah, okay. I get it. I don't like it either, but uh, I know that I was part of the problem here in Maryland. I had... <laughs> I had COVID, our numbers went up, it's my fault, you can blame me. Uh, thank you all for your prayers. I know that you've been praying for me and, and those who have COVID, thank you so much. Uh, I feel great, and just to be clear, I am past the recommended number of days <laughs> that you have to quarantine, so we're following the rules. Um, it's good to see you all here this morning. Even with the masks, we have a God who is so worth being here, so worth praising, amen. He's the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, Emmanuel. So with that said, let's, let's take a moment and, and begin our worship. We're going to pray the, the Lord's Prayer together. It should come up on the screen. Feel free, as always, to say it in any version you have memorized. That's fine. But let's pray this together as we continue in worship turning our hearts, our minds, even our bodies towards the Lord God in heaven who is worthy of our praise. Pray with me. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven, forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's continue to worship. My faith will 
be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander. And my faith will be made stronger in the presence oceans rise my soul will rest in your embrace for i am yours and you are mine for the lord is the spirit and wherever the spirit of the lord is there is freedom so all of us who have had the veil removed can see and reflect the glory of god and the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like Him as we are changed into His glorious image. There's a calm that covers me When I kneel down at your feet it's a place of healing. It's a place where I find freedom. There's a place my eyes can't see where my spirit longs to be. It's a place of healing. in this world that can free me. 
the shame I'm gonna shout for joy at the mention of your name I've come to worship I've come to worship I'm gonna lift my hands till I can reach heaven I'm gonna shout your name till the walls come falling down I've come to worship I've come to worship I'm gonna sing my song like I am unashamed I'm gonna shout for joy at the mention of your name I've come to worship I've come to worship Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind. was grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieved how precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed my chance God, we thank you so much 
for this time that we have to come and just be in your word and to worship you. God, we thank you so much for the promises that you've given us. That even in this scary time, even in this time of sickness and and death and um, fear, that we have you to guide us. That your word says that this world will fall apart, but that it's not the end for us. And we thank you so much for that promise. God, until that time happens, we we pray that you come and you you be with us as uh, you give us the courage to go out and. Just invite our neighbors to come and, and to learn about you and to, to be saved so that their souls can live forever. God, I, I lift up our, our pastors as uh, they have gone through this transition, and I, I thank you so much for your blessing and guidance as, as we've done that. I pray that you be with Paul today as he brings a message. I pray that you be with Mark as he leads us into the, the new leadership of the church. I pray that you be with our new youth pastor as he's, uh, I guess, in transit this week and moving in and that we will surround him with love and and um, just make his his new chapter uh, start off with with excitement. And God, I pray for Tim and I just thank you so much for his leadership and for all that he's done and that you you help him and guide him in his wisdom as, as we go through this. So God, as we come down to the, the end of our summer we just pray that um as we go into unknown territories with our new school system or our new school school year that uh, it won't deter us from shining your light so god be with us now and uh, bring the words to our hearts in jesus name we pray amen you be free from your burden of sin there's power in the blood power in the blood good you or evil the victory win there's wonderful power in the blood would you be wider much wider than snow there's power in the blood power in the blood sin stains are lost in its life-giving flow there's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood, in the blood of the Lamb. Of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. You do service for Jesus, your King. There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you live daily His praises to sing? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood, in the blood of the Lamb. Of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder working power. The precious blood of the Lamb. Power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. Of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Lord, how we need your power every day and every hour. Lord, how we need your power every day and every hour. Every day and every hour, Lord, and we need your power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. In the precious blood of the Lamb. In the precious blood of the Lamb. Wow, I 
wish I was preaching. That was awesome. Thank you. I think that's the first time we've had Ricardo and Jacobo on the same song. I like that. That's outstanding. Praise the Lord. Amen? Awesome. Awesome. Hey, brothers and sisters, uh, hear these words with me from a great part of the Psalms, Psalm 24, and perhaps meditate on these as Paul comes to share the word with us from Mark today. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord, and who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully. He is the one who will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. Let me pray for us. Father, Son, and Spirit, we've already been blessed and encouraged and motivated by being with your people in worship, by being in touch with your Holy Spirit. Lord, we thank you for your presence Lord, continue, please, to camp with us here today in these moments. Lord, every single one of us needs a special touch from you today. And and we need a fresh message, Lord, from your word. So, Lord, we are ready to hear. And, uh, Lord, as I've already prayed this morning for Paul, I pray that it'll be a fire in his bones, a trumpet in his mouth. You'll be clear and powerful as this brother brings the word. Help me to listen and help our lives to be changed. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, church. (laughs) When Mark got up after the first song and said, okay, breathe a sigh of relief, I thought he was going to say, Paul did okay on the drums. (laughs) Always a little nervous about that. But he didn't say that, praise God. Uh, Eric, Pastor Eric is here, officially. We helped he and Sarah and the girls move into their little house in Damascus yesterday. So um, if you uh, have the chance, go up to him at a distance and say hello. Um, He will be in the office working with us this week. Awesome, praise God. Uh, turn to Mark chapter 7, if you have a Bible with you, whether digital or hard copy, Mark chapter 7. We're going to do the whole chapter today, starting in verse 1. If you need a copy of the Bible, a hard copy, I have one to give you. I would love to give it to you. Come see me after the service. If you know somebody who needs a Bible, let me know, and I will give you one to give to them. We want to get the Word of God into people's hands. Mark chapter 7. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and give you the big takeaway point from today. I'm going to give it to you up front so that you can be thinking about it and marinating in it uh, while we go through the chapter today. The big point is do what matters. Do what matters. And this can be a little tricky because sometimes there are things that we think or that we feel matter, but in actuality, they don't really matter. And so do what matters is completely dependent upon first knowing what matters, right? One time, uh, I think it was Christmas, and I can't remember which of my children it was. I'm going to say it's my son, but I'm not sure. Uh, they, they got this toy. Again, don't even remember what it was. But what I do remember is that it lit up and it made lots of noise. And it required batteries. So I put it all together. I think it was my son. So he was super excited about it. And I, I put it all together. I put the batteries in it. And in my mind, what I thought mattered was don't waste the batteries. So I handed it to him and I said, all right. You can push that button, but don't do it too much or you'll wear the batteries down. And my wife was looking at me with her jaw dropped. Like, you've got to be kidding me. What I assumed mattered at the moment was our battery supply. Right? What matters really 
was not our battery supply. What mattered at that moment was loving my son, right? And making sure that every time that button was pushed, the lights would go on and the sound would be loud and that we had enough batteries in the house to make that happen. We need to make sure that we've got the right things in view if we're going to do what matters. We need to make sure that we're not emphasizing the wrong things. We need to make sure that we're emphasizing the things that are good and holy and righteous and just according to what God thinks. We need to emphasize those things. We need to do those things. Do what matters. Today, as we work through Mark chapter 7, there are four stories. I feel like I feel like the chapters come in fours. It's kind of an interesting thing. But there's going to be four stories in chapter 7 where Jesus is going to challenge what the people in the story think matters. He's going to say, ah, I'm not so sure that that matters. Instead, this matters. Do this. We're going to see four instances of that today. Look at Mark chapter 7, starting in verse 1. Now when the Pharisees gathered to him with some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem, they saw that some of his disciples ate with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands, holding to the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other traditions that they observe, such as the washing of cups and pots and copper vessels and dining couches. And the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, that is Jesus, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? I think this is an understandable question for the Pharisees and the scribes to pose to Jesus. And the reason it's understandable is because the Pharisees and the scribes and Jesus and his disciples and all of these people grew up in a context where they were handed down religious traditions from their forefathers that explained to them how to live for God well. In their minds, these aren't just random traditions. They're traditions that root us in how to honor God. That's what they were thinking. The Pharisees were the caretakers of this tradition. The scribes were the caretakers of this tradition. And it's been handed down from people who live their whole lives honoring God. And friends, it's interesting because the Old Testament law, you may not know this, The Old Testament law doesn't actually cover everything that you need to know to live well. It doesn't. The Sabbath is a good example. What counts as work exactly? Is mowing my lawn work? Is is putting together a piece of Ikea furniture? Is that work? For some of us it is. Is grocery shopping work? What's work exactly on the Sabbath? The law isn't super clear. And so with stuff like that, learned, wise, God-fearing people said, okay, we've got to define this more. We have to flesh this out a little bit more so that we can help the people honor God by not breaking the Sabbath. And so all of these traditions of men built up around the law And here comes Jesus. We know what he does. On the Sabbath, he lets his dudes go through the the field plucking wheat. Well, hang on, Jesus. No harvesting, right? Here comes Jesus, who is apparently a rabbi, but he's not making his disciples live by these traditions. And so the Pharisees and the scribes say, Jesus, what's going on, man? Verse 6, and he, that is Jesus, said to them, well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites. It's not a way to make friends. As it is written, this people honors me with their lips, look at this, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, ouch, teaching his doctrine the commandments of men. 
And he stops quoting Isaiah and he's speaking to them now. He says, you leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. Jesus calls them hypocrites. He says, God is not pleased with this worship of yours. The problem is that they talk a good game, right? But their hearts aren't in it. And they teach the doctrines of men as the, they teach the commandments of men as the doctrine of God. They're teaching the rules and the regulations and the ideas and the morals that were built up as traditions around the law. They teach those things as the law. They teach them as the word of God. The Bible teachers have become more important to the Pharisees than the Bible itself. And Jesus says, and just in case you were confused, let me give you an example. Verse 9, and he said to them, you have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your traditions. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother. And whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, if a man tells his father or mother, whatever you would have given, whatever you would have gained from me is Corban. That's an Aramaic word. It means offering. That is given to God. Then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or mother. Thus making void the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down. And just to tack it on. And many such things you do. Huh. So we've got folks saying, God, everything I have belongs to you. Which is good, right? That's God honoring. That's, that's great spiritual stuff, right? But then the Pharisees are coming along and saying, Ah, because you say that, that means nobody, not even your parents, get any of that stuff. And Jesus says, guys... That's crazy. God himself through Moses said, honor your father and your mother. God himself through Moses in Exodus 21 said, whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. Jesus says, in order to hold up your traditions, you're just sweeping the word of God under the rug. You're listening to these Bible teachers over the Bible. And that's the bottom line. The problem is that these Pharisees really, really, really knew what the Bible teachers were saying. And they were letting this override what the Bible was saying. Here's point number one for you today. What matters is knowing what the Bible says more than what Bible teachers say. Church, we've got a Bible literacy problem. Big C church, in the whole church, but I would also say in this church. So many of us just don't know what the Bible says. And I'm not even talking about, I'm not even talking about being able to to get at all of the many facets of what Scripture is saying. I'm just, I'm just talking about what it says. We don't know what Jude is about. We don't know what Amos is about. We don't know what Judges is about. We don't know what 1 Corinthians is about. Instead of reading and devouring and digesting the Bible, we let Bible teachers spoon feed us little nibbles once or twice a week. And that's not what God desires for his people, friends. Now, I'm not saying that Bible teachers don't matter. I, I'm a Bible teacher. Right? But I, I would say, Tim would say, Eric would say, Mark would say, 100 times out of 100, I would rather you be able to quote the Bible than to quote me. What does this mean for us? It means you have to start knowing the Bible. You have to commit to good Bible-knowing habits. You have to read. And not just read to check off the box, but you have to read to understand. And if you don't understand, ask us. The pastors love talking about this stuff. 
ask us. Read the Bible to understand. If you need help putting together a plan to to start knowing the Bible better, ask us. That's what we're here for. What matters is knowing what the Bible says more than what Bible teachers say. Let's keep going. Verse 14. And he called the people to him again, and 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 he said to them, Hear me, all of you, and understand. There's nothing outside of a person that is going, but that by going into him can defile him. But the things that come out of a person are what defile him. And when he had entreated, entered the house and left the people, his disciples asked him about the parable. And he said to them, then are you also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him, since it enters not his heart, but his stomach, and is expelled? Thus he declared all foods clean. So, so now Jesus doubles back on the topic that the Pharisees and the scribes started out with, right? Remember, they were, they were upset because Jesus' disciples were eating before washing their hands. They said that they were defiled. So Jesus goes back to this idea after he insults them, right? He goes back to their primary concern. And he says, guys, defiling is not an outside-in problem. Defiling is an inside-out problem and it's kind of refreshing how how modern the truth is that jesus is giving us here right he says all that's going on when you're eating is just digestion right i love that there's nothing about eating that's gonna make you defiled and the gospel writer mark here says that by saying this he declares all food clean and this is fascinating what Jesus is actually doing here is he's, he's reaching back in the Old Testament law and he's saying, you know that distinction among animals between clean and unclean? Jesus is saying, that doesn't matter anymore. Whoa! What? How can you say that? That's a valid question. How can Jesus do that? I think this is at least part of the reason. The clean, unclean distinction between animals pretty much had everything to do with sacrifices. And Jesus, in a few short months, is about to offer the best and last sacrifice that humanity will ever need. So this clean, unclean distinction, we don't need it anymore. Because sacrifices will be done away with because of Jesus. So then the question arises, what defiles what, what actually damages our relationship with God? If it's, not, if it's not the food going in, what is it exactly? Verse 20. And he said, what comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. Church, sin is baked into our humanity because of the fall. Sin is constantly threatening to destroy everything that we love. And and we carry it around with us everywhere. Jesus is saying, we don't have a food problem. We have a sin problem. And so here's what I think he's teaching us today. What matters... Is thinking about righteousness more than rituals. Thinking about righteousness more than rituals. The Pharisees, the scribes, thought that, that they would obtain righteousness from doing all of these things. That somehow, if they could just adhere to the traditions handed down by the fathers, that that would make them right with God. That that would repair the damage between them and God. But the Bible is clear that there are no rituals that will get rid of your sin. Being in this building won't do it. 
Singing these songs won't do it. Reciting the prayers won't do it. Genuflecting, crossing yourself, none of that stuff is going to make you right with God. Rituals don't take away the damage done to your relationship with God by your own sin. Only the person and the work of Jesus Christ can do that. Jesus suffered the just wrath of God that you deserve and that I deserve when he died on the cross. And he suffered that wrath so that our sin debt to God would be paid off forever. When he died, he made our sin as good as dead so that we could live for God. Romans 6.11, consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. So what does this mean? Well, that has a meaning for both Christians and non-Christians, for believers and non-believers. It means stop trying to earn your salvation. You can't do it. Stop thinking that what you do earns salvation. Now again, this is what matters is thinking about righteousness more than rituals. That doesn't mean rituals are useless. They can be helpful in getting our minds thinking about God. They can be helpful in getting our bodies to, to try and pursue God a little bit more. But they don't pay for sins. Only Jesus does that. You cannot claw your way out of the hole of sin that you've dug. You have to turn away from your sin, accept Jesus' gift of forgiveness, and you have to follow him. Who needs to do that today? Believer, maybe you've fallen into the trap of working, 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 because you think God's not pleased with you unless you work, work, work. It's not true, friends. You are loved as a son or daughter because of your faith in Jesus. Friend, maybe you're not a believer. There is freedom for you from your sin. Embrace Jesus. What matters is thinking about righteousness more than ritual. Let's keep going. Verse 24. And from there he arose and went away to the region of Tyre. And Sidon. And he entered a house and did not want anyone to know, yet he could not be hidden. But immediately a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician by birth, and she begged him to cast out the demon out of her daughter. And he said to her, Let the children be fed first. For it's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. And she answered him, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And he said to her, For this statement you may go your way. The demon has left your daughter. And she went home and found the child lying in bed and the demon gone. So we have another example here of Jesus going into Gentile territory. Tyre and Sidon were north of the land of Israel along the Mediterranean coast. And again, we have another example of someone coming, running at Jesus, falling down in front of him and begging him. We've seen that over and over again in the last two or three chapters. What I want you to remember here is the, the likely social situation. There's three things to remember. Number one, Jews do not associate with Gentiles. That doesn't happen. Nobody in the Jewish world wants that to happen at this time. Jews don't associate with Gentiles. This woman is a Gentile. Number two, at this time, in this place, men do not generally talk to women in public. Doesn't happen. You shouldn't do that. Number three, Jesus is a Jewish rabbi. He is far too respectable to be breaking these social norms. There's lots of social pressure for Jesus to act a certain way. All of his disciples felt that social pressure. Any Jew that's with him would have felt that social pressure. All social and cultural norms demanded that Jesus would reject this lady. And shockingly, 
for us, because we know Jesus, he does at first. He says, look, lady, the Messiah came first to save Israel. All the prophets, all the law, all the promises were first given to Israel. And Jesus is essentially saying, look, now that I'm here, they get access to me first. And I think this is another moment of Jesus testing. Does she, does she really believe who he is? Does she really want what he has? And so the woman actually acknowledges this. She accepts it. She says, Lord, you're right. You first go to Israel. But she presses him even more into his grace here. She says, look, I know you belong to them, but just give me the leftovers because that will be enough. And Jesus, defying all social pressure, defying all cultural norms, helps her and heals her daughter. I think what Jesus is teaching us here is that what matters is doing good to everyone, not just to those who are acceptable. Who are the people that don't quite make your acceptable list? Those affiliated with a certain political party? Those of a certain socioeconomic status? God forbid, those of a different skin color? Church, remember, we were God's enemies. Paul says in Ephesians 2 that we were children of wrath. Psalm 5, we forget this all the time. Psalm 5 actually says God hates sinners. All of us were completely unacceptable to God. But, Romans 5, God shows his great love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus demonstrates here that what matters is doing good regardless of who society says is acceptable to you, regardless of who makes your acceptable list. Godly love acts regardless of who you think deserves it. You didn't deserve it. I didn't deserve it. But God gave it anyway. And we are to mirror what He does. Who needs this from you? What sin of prejudice do you need to repent of today so that tomorrow you can do good to everyone? Verse 31, then he returned from the region of Tyre and went through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. And they brought to him a man who was deaf and had a speech impediment. And they begged him to lay his hand on him. And taking him aside from the crowd privately, he put his fingers in his ears and after spitting, touched his tongue. <laughs> and looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Ephatha. That is, be opened. And his ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. And Jesus charged them to tell no one. But the more he charged them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. And they were astonished beyond measure, I love this, saying, He has done all things well. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. So the Decapolis is, is a collection of Ten towns, Deca, ten, Polis, city. A collection of ten towns is kind of scattered across northern and central Israel. Some are on the other side of the Sea of Galilee. But, but Jesus probably has entered back into Jewish territory now. And they bring him a guy who's deaf, and probably because he's deaf, he can't speak well. And, 
And Jesus does some weird stuff here, right? He puts fingers in the guy's ear. And I think I would have laughed if I saw him do that. Fingers in his ear. And then Jesus spits. I don't know. Does he spit on the guy? Does he spit on the ground? I don't know how this works. And then it says he touches his tongue. That's just bizarre. I don't understand that. Just weird and gross, right? It's just weird and gross. And guys, Jesus doesn't need to do this to heal people. We've already seen him heal people from miles away. Why does he do this? What's with the weird grossness? So uh, Pastor Mark and I were actually talking about this, and, and what he suggests, what Pastor Mark suggests, is that, look, we just saw a bunch of stories of the, the Pharisees and the scribes getting all bent out of shape about defiling and washing, being unclean. And, and there's nothing, I don't think, in the law that Jesus is doing that the law is saying he's unclean. But look, if I weren't a Baptist, I would bet some good money that Jesus would be unclean according to the tradition of the Pharisees here. I bet he's doing stuff that they wouldn't approve of. There's earwax and spit flying all over the place. That's nasty, right? But he's giving a man his hearing and his speech back. He's doing the good work of God, even if it makes him look a little dirty in the eyes of somebody else. I think this is what he's teaching us. What matters is doing the work, even if you get a little dirty. Sometimes loving people well means that we deal with some of their junk. Sometimes loving each other in the church well means that we have to deal with each other's junk. Sometimes in order to love people and to give them Jesus, we have to hold their hand and wade through the muck and the mess of alcohol addiction or porn addiction or sexual abuse or mental illness or whatever. And it's messy and it's dirty. And I don't know that any of us really want to wade through that stuff. But we do want to love them. We want to show them and tell them about Jesus. So we take their hand and we walk with them through the muck. What matters is doing the work, even if you get a little dirty. And of course, I'm not, I'm not talking about joining in someone's sin. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about bearing some of the emotional and relational burden of walking with them through their struggle. And so again, who needs this from you? Who has God put in your life whose life is a little messy, but you could help if you just got a little dirty? You got anybody like that? Church, do what matters. Do what matters. Challenge what you think matters. Make sure it lines up with what God is saying. Running out of batteries didn't matter. I could go to the store and buy a whole bunch more. What mattered was loving my son. Don't get caught up in doing what just suits your preferences. Don't get caught up in doing what you think the culture expects of you. Listen to what God says matters from the scriptures and go and do it. Let's pray. God, I'm so thankful for your word. I'm so thankful that it teaches us such awesome, profound, really simple things. And I pray, God, that you would help us do them. I pray, Father, that today you would help us to examine the things that we think matter. And I pray that 
If they don't matter according to you, that we would drop them. If they do matter according to you, I pray that we would do them. Teach us, God, to do what you think matters. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise God for the word of God. Amen. Church, a couple of announcements and then you're dismissed. Um, we have been reminding for a while now, but if you're, if you're having trouble getting church emails, if, if things aren't making it to you, go ahead and add media at greenridgebaptist.org to your contacts. That should help. Um, we want to encourage you to continue giving. Your, your tithes, your offering, they are an act of worship. Um, they are good for our souls, uh, but they are also how the people of God join together to get the work of the ministry done. And so please partner with us in that. You can uh, give online at the address there. We also have a business meeting uh, today at 1130. This is over Zoom. This is for our, our members. And so if you're a member of the church, please uh, make yourself available. Please hop on this Zoom call. That should be in your email inbox. If it is not, reach out to um, one of the pastors. Probably Pastor Paul is the best one, but if you, if you email me, I'll, I'll try to make sure to get you the link as well. Um, but be at that meeting. We're going to talk about stuff of the church. Um, and last but not least, uh, like we said, Pastor Eric is here. Woo! That's awesome. Um, and so Pastor Eric is doing a sort of a meet and greet, and this is primarily for youth and youth families. Is that correct? Yes. So if you are the parents of a teenager, a uh, middle school and high school student, come bring your whole family, and uh, there's going to be lunch. It's August 15th at 11.15. Um, so I think it's an early lunch, but uh, come on out. He wants to get to know you. He wants to meet you. This is a chance for you to meet him and make some of those connections. Uh, we're, we're grateful that he got to do that at camp, um, and here's another chance to do that. Um, please register for that by going to gbc.pub slash meet, gbc.pub slash meet. For a second, my brain, when I first saw that, thought that that was telling us that the lunch would be very meat heavy, um, that there was just going to be steak and more steak, but anyway. Those are our announcements for today. Um, I hope that as, as you leave, as you head to your, your week, um, that you would be pondering what it would look like for you to do what matters a little better. Uh, we all need to grow in this. We all need to grow in this. And so let's this week be thinking um, what can I do differently? What really matters and how can I walk in that? One of the things I want to encourage you to do this week that I think matters is verbally invite those folks that you have been uh, thinking of and praying about. I, we asked you last week to consider uh, three people, three names, three households, right, that you could invite to church this month. Because if you're anything uh, like me, it took a lot of invites to get you in the door, right? And so we don't uh, want to just uh, invite someone once. We want to kind of bug them for the whole month and put it in their ear for the whole month and let them know for the whole month that our restart is September 12th. And so I want to encourage you to verbally invite those people that you have thought of uh, this week. Invite them. And it doesn't have to be long. It could just be, hey, our church is doing this big grand reopening on September 12th. Thought you might want to know. Children's ministry, all that stuff. It's exciting. Just verbally invite someone. And uh, in the following weeks, we're going to give you more and more tools to kind of reach out to people and invite. Let me read Jude 24 and 25 over you as your benediction. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Have a great week.